Good morning and thank you for joining us for the X-ray Vision Imaging for Fio Para session of the Fio Para Alliance Virtual Conference. I am Amy of Fio Para, also known as Amy Powell, Fio Para Alliance in Community Engagement Specialist. I was also a caregiver for my mother and my brother John. I'm here with Dr. David Taib, whom I will properly introduce in a moment. But first, this program is brought to you by Fio Para Alliance whose mission is to empower patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, their families and medical professionals through advocacy, education, and a global community of support, while helping to advance research that accelerates treatments and cures. We'd like to extend a special thanks to Progenics and Advanced Accelerator Applications for making this conference possible. Before we get started, I want to mention Pheo Para Awareness Week, which is this week. There are plenty of ways you can participate. All of the info can be found at fiopara.org. You can also share posts about Awareness Week on social media and attend the special virtual events we've got scheduled. Again, the information for those events are on social media or on fiopara.org. Our agenda this morning will be, Dr. Taib will present for 25 minutes. Afterward, I will briefly share my experience and ways in which I can encourage you all to embrace your inner superhero with a focus on mind-body wellness. Then we will begin answering your questions. The information presented on this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not substitute for the advice of your doctor and medical team because they have in-depth knowledge of your medical history and current situation. In addition, we want you to know that the content of this program is not influenced by any of our sponsors or supporters. And now I'd like to introduce our expert for this session, Dr. David Taib. David Taib, MD, PhD, is full professor of nuclear medicine at Aix-Marseille University, France. Dr. Taib is a Medica, Medic, member of the European Association of Medicine, Nuclear Medicine, and sits on the Oncology and Theranostics Committee. He holds numerous research grants, is co-author of two textbooks dedicated to nuclear endocrinology, and has over 240 peer-reviewed publications on PubMed. A major focus of Dr. Taib's clinical research in collaboration with the NIH has been to improve disease characterization by molecular imaging of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. In addition, he is actively involved in therapeutic nuclear medicine with a major focus on endocrine neoplasms. He is also affiliated with INSERM, the French Institute of Health and Medical Research, with several ongoing basic research projects on nanomedicine and nucleic acid therapies. More recently, he coordinated the joint EANM practice guideline SNMMI procedure standard 2019 for radionuclide imaging of FIOPARA. He is currently co-chair of the upcoming future clinical practice guidelines for patients harboring germline mutations in the SDHD and SDHB genes. Dr. Taib, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this nice introduction. It is my pleasure to be with you uh, today. And um, my topic is on the imaging of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, PPGL. And uh, this is a nuclear physician's view. For us, it is important to consider Tsai, that PPGL are caused by inherited genetic mutation more than other nets. It is, as you know, about 40% of cases, and it is mostly observed for patients with extra adrenal PPGL. PPGL can be malignant, and this is mostly observed in patients with large PPGL between four to five or more centimeters, or associated with a mutation in SDH, SDHB genes and sometimes SDHD gene. And as you know, malignancy is defined only by the presence of metastasis in nodes, bone, 
or visceral organs. It is not defined by pathological examination. We know also, and you know, that PPGL are highly vascularized. Probably um, PPGL are one of the most uh, vascularized tumor. And this explains why uh, in, for example, large head and neck paraganglioma and, for example, large jugular paraganglioma, it is important to perform embolization prior any surgery. You also know that PPGL can be widely distributed from the skull base to the pelvic floor. And PPGL uh, may arise from either parasympathetic paraganglia or sympathetic paraganglia. Most and almost all head and neck paraganglioma are associated with the parasympathetic nervous system and usually do not secrete catecholamine. And by contrast, um, retroperitoneal paraganglioma, such as furchromocytoma that arise from the adrenal medulla or extra adrenal retroperitoneal PPGL, usually are uh, uh, are always associated with the sympathetic nervous system and usually secrete catecholamines. As you know, there are somewhat um, relationship between genotype and tumor locations. Uh, for example, for patient with SDHB mutation, most of the PPGL are located in the retroperitoneum like adrenal medulla or extra adrenal retroperitoneal locations and sometimes they are um, located in the head and neck and the malignancy risk is about 30 percent of cases. For SDHD um, malignancy is lower but it is not zero and Patients are always uh, head and neck paraganglomas, and often multifocal uh, head and neck paraganglioma. And it is, it is not rare that patients also have some small uh, abdominal uh, paraganglioma associated with this head and neck paraganglomas. And for SDHC, it is the location is almost always restricted to the head and neck and thoracic regions. And for the three genes, we can have some also associated tumors like renal cell carcinoma, GIST, or pituitary adenoma. By contrast, for VHL patient, we can find field chromocytoma that can be bilateral or abdominal uh, paraganglomas, but there are quasi no um, paraganglioma located in the head and neck region. And as you know, there are some uh, associated tumors. And for NF1 and RET mutation uh, associated with, with MEN2 disease, the tumor are always, almost always located in the adrenal medulla. And the malignancy risk is very low. And there are also additional gene mutations. Um, patients are usually referred to nuclear physician or radiologist by endocrinologists, by endocrine, digestive, or urolo urological surgeons, especially in the setting of preoperative staging or restaging by ENT surgeon when they have to stage craniocervical masses or from oncologists in the context of metastatic PPGL. The first line imaging uh, investigation is CT. Uh, CT use multiple X-rays and the principle is based on X-ray 
attenuation by tissues. The signal is spontaneous, but um, most and all CT scan uh, are based uh, and follows uh, the injection of iodine. And there are some very important advantages uh, for CT. It is a very quick examination. It is less costly than MRI. It has a very high resolution and it is very accurate for uh, preoperative staging. And there are some disadvantages and especially the exposure to ionizing radiations. This is two example. One, the first one on the left side is a typical ferrochromocytoma, left ferrochromocytoma, as you can see here. This is a well delineated adrenal mass. And most of this tumor are, are highly vascularized. And this is clearly shown by the uh, uptake of iodine contrasts. Sometimes there are some cystic or uh, some, some cystic components or calcification. On the right side, you can see here a very a small extra adrenal uh, PPGL located in the preaortic region. Regarding MRI, uh, MRI use a powerful magnetic fields. Uh, the principle is based on the magnetic properties of hydrogen nuclei in water. The signal can be spontaneous, but um, MRI investigation usually, usually are, are based also uh, on gadolinium injection. And there are some advantages. It has, it is, MRI is an excellent investigation for liver extension, soft tissues or bone marrow uh, metastasis. It, does not use uh, radiations, but it has some disadvantages like a lower resolution than CT scan, scan, and it is costly. As you can see here, it, this is a, a nice vagus nerve per ganglioma, and you can also see uh, the vagus nerves, normal vagus nerves, that is, it is. Um, it is located just close to the paraganglioma. And below you can see a uh, right extra adrenal paraganglioma. And uh, with this nice uh, reconstruction, you can see the extension to the vena cava. And this is very important prior, prior any surgery to clearly delineate uh, the, the tumor. This is also a, an example of a Chamblin 3 um, carotid body paraganglioma with a, an extension uh, along the common carotid, internal carotid, and external carotid artery. And this is clearly important to know if it's possible to perform surgery uh, for carotid paraganglioma. With MRI, you can also perform a specific sequences called spectral MRI. And the spectral MRI um, can uh, allow to detect succinate accumulation. And this succinate uh, accumulation is a typical feature of patient with SDH related PPGL. This can also be done for example, in a thoracic or abdominal PPGL. This is a nice technique for this. And there are some new data that are very interesting with uh, some new sequences and uh, the um, use of succinate in the evaluation, for example, of therapeutic responses. But you know, and it is important to consider that, for example, for head and neck paraganglioma, this tumor are developing in a very uh, complex anatomical situation, location, uh, with, and they could invade a mixed nerve, 
that could invade also the temporal bone, but also the, the internal carotid, but also the brain stem. And it is important to consider that the evaluation of the local regional extension uh, requires the combination of temporal bone CT, but also MRI to fully delineate uh, the tumors and to clearly map uh, the different extension. And this is important, not only for surgery, but also for uh, radiotherapy. Uh, this is a typical uh, tympanic paraganglioma. And this is a MR angiography. And as you can see here, you can see a very small tympanic paraganglioma. And this tumor are highly vascularized and has, uh, uh, has a very high intensity at the arterial phase. And this is typical from uh, PPGL. Regarding nuclear imaging, this is quite different because this is a molecular. Um, 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 this means that this is a functional imaging. Uh, in the setting of a PPGL patient, we can use MIBG scan or PET imaging with various radi radiopharmaceuticals. And the principle is the detection of the emission photons. It could be uh, gamma photons from MIBG scan from MIBG um, iodine 123, or annihilation photon from uh, PET radiopharmaceuticals. Uh, the signal can be obtained only after injection of radiopharmaceuticals. The advantages are a very high sensitivity and a very high specificity, and this is linked to the molecular targeting. But there are some disadvantages compared to morphological imaging. The, the sensitivity is variable across disease subtypes, and we will see some relationship between sensitivity and a genotype. It is costly, and there is an exposure to ionizing radiations. We see three different examples of pheochromocytoma with head-to-head -head comparison between dopapet and uh, dotatate uh, analog. It's, it's a somatostatic analog. It is called dotatate, and it is labeled with gallium-68. And as you can see here, in the three examples, the results are comparable with a strong uptake of rochromocytoma with both radiopharmaceuticals. It is important for you to consider that the three modalities, CT scan, MRI, and functional imaging provide some complementary informations. And sometimes it is important to combine the three investigation and this is very important, for example, before any surgery or any therapeutic uh, issue or radiotherapy. It is really important to be exhaustive. Uh, and, 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 and these three modalities provide some very useful complementary informations. The role of functional nuclear imaging is important and can be used for to confirm a diagnosis in dupedful situation. For example, a large uh, head and neck mass, and we want to distinguish, for example, paraganglioma from a nervous nervous uh, tumors like schwannoma, for example. It enables early detection of PPGL in hereditary cases, and this will facilitate curative treatment, but also provide some information, critical information for appropriate follow-up, which region has to be followed. It provides critical information because it can detect multifocality, but also metastasis. And it is really important for uh, influencing therapeutic decision. This is not the same case 
with bilateral head and neck paraganglioma compared to a single uh, paraganglioma, for example, in a carotid body, uh, in a carotid body. So the diagnosis, diagnostic of multifocality is very important in the management of patients. And of course, it selects, it is mandatory to select patients who are likely to benefit from radiotherapeutics. There are some different radiopharmacy calls, and it is important to consider that the mechanisms involved in the uptake of this radiopharmaceutical are very different across them. You have to know that, for example, the mechanism involved in DOPA uptake are different from fluorodopamine, and the mechanism involved in fluorodopamine uptake are the same than for MIBG. For DOPA, it enters via an amino acid transporter. This is not specific of DOPA. But for dopamine or MIBG, it enters through the norepinephrine transporter. It is a very specific transporter expressed at the cell surface of PPGL. Uh, for somatostatin analogs, it enters because it can target, they can target somatostatin receptor uh, at the cell surface of the PPGL. And for agonists, the, um, the uptake of the radiopharmaceutical will induce internalization of the radiopharmaceutical. For antagonists, somatostatin antagonists, they will leave at the cell surface. And for FDG, it enter through the glute transporters. You have to know that FDG uptake is very important in SDH patient, and FDG can be performed for SDH uh, PPGL. This is a young patient with a left phoconocytoma. You can see here the very strong avidity for FDG. And it was a typical phylpronocytoma without any feature of malignancy. But it was the uptake was only due uh, to ge the genetic status because the patient has a mutation in the SDHB gene. So FDG uptake, strong uptake, is clearly a, a, a feature of F SDH uh, of, of mutation in one of the SDH genes. This is the same for head and neck paraganglioma. You can see small, multiple head and neck paraganglioma. And the uptake is strong because the patient has uh, SDH mutation. So you have to know that PET imaging using FDG has to be restricted to the patient with SDH mutation. Dopa PET can be performed for patient with sporadic head and neck paraganglomas, but also patient with uh, SDH mutation. For sporadic, this is clearly a very sensitive investigation for head and neck paraganglioma. As you can see here, you can see a bilateral, a multiple head and neck paraganglomas. And this was a patient with SDHD mutation. But you have to know that Dopepet is not approved in all countries. Uh, but it, for me, it is an important radiopharmaceutical and it has not to be through out with bath water. But we know that it is costly. There are some labeling challenges. There is no teranostic information with this radiopharmaceutical and it has a limited prognostic information, but in some casing, cases, it is helpful. And it is helpful, for example, in patient with pheochromocytoma, and this is three cases of patient with multiple uh, adrenal uh, PPGL. There are multiple pheochromocytoma in the bilateral uh, and bilateral pheochromocytoma in patient with max mutation with mutation in the max gene and one of the uh, very important information is linked to the 
very low uptake by the LC adrenal cortex and the low uptake by the LC adrenal cortex allow to depict all of the small different tumors. And it is important when you want to, for example, to perform a cortical sparing surgery because it provides some complementary information to morphological information uh, to morphological imaging. And this is not the case, for example, for dotated imaging because the adrenal cortex is um, um, has a very important uptake uh, on dopa pet, uh, on somatostatin receptor PET imaging. And you will not be able to depict all of the small uh, pheochromocytoma. For VHL disease, somatostatin receptor PET is not, is not a good radiopharmastical. This is a rare case of, metast of VHL disease with metastatic disease. This is not very frequent, but as you can see here, there are two different locations uh, in the thorax and no uptake uh, or very faint uptake on somatostatin receptor PET imaging. And as you can see here, there was also a left small uh, pheochromocytoma. And you can see this small pheochromocytoma due to the low uptake by the LC glands. But as you can see here on somatostatin receptor PET imaging, called so SSA, uh, the uptake by the adrenal cortex prevents any detection of this small Pragenglioma of the small pheochromocytoma. And also on FDG, you can see the left small pheochromocytoma and a single metastasis, but the FDG missed uh, uh, another uh, metastasis in the lung. So for dopapet, for, 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 for patients with VHL disease, dopapet imaging is the best radiopharmacy core. But you have to know that dopapet can miss some pragenglioma, especially in patients with SDH PPGL, and um, not in the head and neck, but in the abdomen. This is a patient with multiple, it, this patient, this, this was a young patient with the SDHB mutation, and he has two different extra adrenal uh, pragenglioma. Uh, that were detected by uh, morphological imaging uh, close to the aorta. One was, lat uh, was lateroartic, left lateroartic pragenglioma, and was, one was preaortic pragenglioma. And you, as you can see on the right side, the uptake was strong on FDG because he has a mutation in the SDHB chain, but there was, there was no uptake uh, with dopapet. So dopapet can help in the detection of uh, SDH head and neck pregnant but may miss uh, many um, uh, abdominal uh, uh, PPGL in this setting. So I think the good indication for dopapet is sporadic uh, par, uh, PPGL or a patient with uh, VHL disease or mutation in IF2, uh, in the IF2 gene. Somatostatin receptor PET imaging is probably the best radiopharmaceutical for head and neck paraganglioma because the uptake is very strong. This is a very rare example of head-to-head -head comparison in a patient with SDHD, head and neck paraganglioma. And as you can see here, dopapet mist. Uh, left uh, cervical paraganglioma that was clearly detected by somatostatin receptor PET imaging. And this is a head-to-head -head comparison in another case, cases uh, in another case um, of patient with multiple head and neck paraganglioma. And as you can see here, the uptake on the left side was very faint and it was, the uptake was stronger with somatostatin analogs. And somatostatin PET imaging is very good for the detection of all small uh, head and neck paraganglioma, especially in patients with SDH mutation. In the cases of patients with metastatic disease, 
uh, associated with mutation is in one of the SDH gene. Uh, somatostatin receptor PET is superior to, is clearly superior to DOPA PET and MIBG scan. And most of the time is it is superior to FDG, but FDG scan, FDG PET imaging is a very good radiopharmaceutical for patients with SDH mutations. To summarize, SDH, um, FDG PET should be used only in patients with SDH mutation. DOPA PET should be used in patients with uh, RET mutation or NF1 mutation or VHL disease or patients with metastatic disease, but in the context of sporadic, uh, con in, in a sporadic context, not for SDH because you will miss uh, a lot of lesion with the PET and somatostatin receptor PET imaging with dotatate, for example, is the best radiopharmaceutical for patients with SDH mutation and should not be performed in patients with VHL disease and can be performed in patients with NF1, but we could be, uh, we could be, there are some drawbacks uh, due to the uptake by the LC adrenal glands. And you have to know it is important that uh, the use of molecular imaging is important uh, for selecting patients who are likely to benefit from radiotherapeutics like uh, MIBG scan for MIBG therapy or somatostatin receptor PET for mutatera, for example. So in conclusion, imaging investigation should be and need to be performed or reviewed by experienced radiologists or nuclear physicians. The choice of the radiopharmaceutical should be tailored to individual situations and all treatment and management decision of PPGL patients should be carried out in an expert interdisciplinary endocrine tumor board to ensure favorable outcome. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues and Professor Karel Pachak from the NIH because we have worked a lot and we continue to, to work a lot together. And uh, I would like to thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Taib, for the very useful information. In a moment, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my journey and provide some ways you can empower yourself as it relates to our session. But first, a reminder to attendees that you can enter questions you might have for Dr. Taib at any time in the chat window. There's also a link to a poll. Please feel free to participate. It's difficult to overstate the importance of imaging. Along with biochemical testing, it makes up the dynamic duo uh, essential to both the diagnosis and management of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. For many, imaging is the messenger that brings unexpected and unwelcome news that life is about to change. Often when a so-called incidentaloma, a tumor discovered while being evaluated for an unrelated reason is found. This is how my family's Viopera story began when I asked my mother's doctors to evaluate her for peripheral artery disease. What I expected to be a fairly routine sonogram of her legs and abdomen turned quickly, quickly into a series of hastily made appointments for CTs and MRIs to help determine the nature of the abdominal mass the initial sonogram uncovered. Ultimately, her diagnosis took an, another several months and we have imaging and a plasma-free metanephrine test, that dynamic duo I mentioned earlier, to thank for it. That diagnosis ultimately took us to the NIH where she had more imaging studies along with genetic testing. My brother John made the trip himself soon afterward and imaging revealed two new skull-based tumors. It also showed us how serious the recurrence of his carotid body tumor truly was. The inherited syndrome imaging helped to uncover provided a lens through which our complicated family medical history made sense and led to my involvement with the FIOPAIR community. It guided treatment decisions John and my mother made as they took divergent paths to manage their disease. 
and it informed the end of life decisions I had to make for them both. In summary, imaging changed our lives. Yet imaging is a mixed bag. It provides a lot of information which can be vindicating and empowering, confirming to you and your doctors that it wasn't just all in your head and helping to name the mysterious ailment that's been plaguing you sometimes for years. But as you move past your initial diagnosis and treatment into the monitoring stage, something new happens. A new monster settles in and sets to work, disrupting your sleep and eroding your sense of well being. Scanxiety. Scanxiety or anxiety about upcoming imaging to monitor for recurrence or progression of your disease is real and common. A recent study reported that over half of people with cancer experience it to a significant degree. It's normal. You can't monitor potential tumor growth on your own. It's understandable for many reasons. And most importantly, it's okay to feel that way. Dealing with that monster effectively must include identifying what thing or things make you anxious. Many people worry about the health effects of repeated scans, particularly if nuclear imaging is involved. It's important to know that nuclear medicine, including nuclear imaging, is well regulated. If you have concerns, speak with your healthcare team. Ask about the risks of imaging and what is really necessary when your individual history is taken into account. You can also visit the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging online for patient-focused resources that address this very issue. You might also be worried about what scans might uncover. Again, discussing this with your healthcare provider is a good place to start. We know that some syndromes carry a greater risk of tumors coming back and spreading than others. Your doctor can help you to understand the probability of recurrence or the typical rate of growth. It might also help to talk to family members about your fears and concerns. Your caregivers need to know how you're feeling in order to fully support you. And let's be honest, when we're anxious, we're stressed, and that stress touches all parts of our lives. Being open and honest about how you're feeling mentally as well as physically helps to ensure that your interpersonal relationships remain stable and strong. You might also want to seek support from a peer. The FIOPARA Alliance has peer support programs that offer not only monthly group meetings, but also the option to be paired with another patient or caregiver for one-on-one -on -one support. Visit us online for more information about these services and how to sign up. If your scanxiety is part particularly bad or persistent, you might want to consider talking to a mental health professional. Again, this is normal and it's okay. It might even surprise you to learn that there are psychiatrists and counselors who specialize in working with cancer patients and are intimately familiar with the unique concerns a patient like you might have about treatment, life in general, or what the future holds. If you need assistance finding this type of care in your area, talk to your healthcare team or reach out to the FIOPARA Alliance. And I do want to note here too that a counselor doesn't have to have particular experience in counseling patients with FIO or PARA to be useful to you. And you could look at that relationship as an opportunity to spread more awareness about FIOPARA to people in the medical community who aren't aware of it. Finally, I'd like to share some practical advice to help you navigate your journey as a patient. First is, buy a binder, a big one, if you haven't. Keep copies of your medical records, imaging studies and reports here and keep it current. Take it with you to your appointments. Also take a family member or another support person to those appointments. It helps to have someone there to listen and to take notes and also to ask questions that you might not have thought of yourself. Keep in mind that it is your right as a patient to ask for your records as well as copies of your scans and associated reports. I would personally encourage you to read through the reports and ask questions of your healthcare team. Most patients who are well informed and an active partner in their healthcare experience better outcomes and feel more positive about where they're headed. 
And above all, remember that the members of your healthcare team are your allies. They're fighting for you. It's important to keep those relationships friendly and positive. Lifelong monitoring for all diagnosed with Theopara means that you'll be working together for a long time. I'd like to extend a big thank you to Dr. Taib and we'll open it up for questions. One of the first questions, Dr. Taib, that we have um, is a question, can you explain what you mean by multifocality? Uh, yes, multifocality means that the patient has, mul has multiple PPGL. It could be in the same gland, for example, you could have in patient with MEN2 disease, two furcromocytoma in the same gland, in the same adrenal glands. But most of the time, multifocality refers to the, uh, the presence of multiple PPGL that can coexist uh, in all different locations. Could be a single head and neck paraganguma together with a furcromocytoma it's a combination of mixed parasympathetic or sympathetic paragangliomas. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Um, what do you suggest if a patient has a history of Pheopara, a genetic mutation, and is very symptomatic, but imaging isn't showing anything? Um, and uh, it, it, it does not show anything regardless of the imaging. For example, on both morphological CT scan and MRI, there is no thing, but the patient is symptomatic. If the patient is symptomatic, usually we perform a, a PET CT also. And if there is no, uh, no tumor uh, in a patient with ge genetic mutation, it depends on the, the symptoms but I will refer the patient to a cardiologist because some patients, for example, may have some uh, sympathetic hyperactivities and uh, it can provoke some uh, symptoms and it is unrelated to, uh, it is unrelated to the tumor. So if all of the investigation, imaging investigation are negative, uh, CT scan, MRI and PET CT, with uh, the good radiopharmacy called tailored to the, to the specific uh, mutation, I would refer the patient to a cardiologist uh, to check and to try to identify some uh, um, sympathetic hypertonia or sympathetic disorders that may explain, for example, uh, um, hypo, um, uh, orthostatic uh, um, um, uh, a decrease in blood pressure, for example, uh, in the orthostatic uh, condition. So yes, clearly I will continue uh, with PET imaging and after I will, I will refer patient to cardiologists. Okay, great, that's useful. We get a lot of questions like that. Another question, my metastases are only seen on CT scan, not on MIBG, FDG and gallium 68 dota tape. How is that possible? Yes, this is not very frequent because usually uh, bone marrow metastasis can be clearly depicted uh, by PET imaging, but is never it is never um, impossible. Uh, it 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 may depends. Uh, first of all, it would be important to know if the primary tumors. Um, is positive on the PET CT on, on the functional imaging. If the primary tumor is positive on the PET imaging and only bone metastases are not detected by PET imaging, uh, it could depend on the size of the tumors. If clearly uh, this, this location clearly are correspond to metastases, I think um, it, it may be uh, due to the lack of specificity of a given radiopharmaceutical for this bone met. But we have to be sure that, that clearly the bone location corresponds to uh, metastasis because this is not so frequent to have a bone, met, bone marrow metastasis that are missed by PET imaging. I, I would like first to be sure that the lesion correspond to metastasis 
uh, on uh, on pathological uh, investigation to be sure that this is not, for example, false positive finding, uh, but not uh, really metastasis. But if the lesions are clearly metastat metastasis on pathological imaging, this is never impossible because as you know, now the specificity of PET imaging clearly depends on the molecular targeting and we never know for individual cases. Sometimes some lesion can be missed by PET imaging, but this is not very frequent. Okay, okay. Um, another question, for those of us who are early in advocating for screening and diagnosis and do not have an identified mutation, do you have any general guidance about which type of imaging to ask for first? With it being so difficult to get a provider to agree to even look for Pheopara, um, many patients worry about a less than optimal scan being ordered and dismissed. So that's a good question. What, what without a mutation, would identify Theo and Para? What would you order first? Okay, so the pain, it depends on the mutation. For example, it, what it depends of the it depends of the mutation for, for example, for for men two of VHL disease. I think it is not mandatory to perform PET imaging. It depends on on each individual question uh, because most of the lesion are, can be clearly detected by morphological imaging, but it is important in the pre-op imaging, but just for screening, I think that um, CT scan or even MRI could be a good first line imaging procedure. I think we do not need for example, also for NF1, red patient or mesh patient with VHL, VHL disease, uh, PET imaging uh, just for screening. For a patient with SDH, I think uh, I, I would like first to have a PET imaging at, at the diagnosis, at the di not for screening, but if the patient has at least one one PPGL, I would suggest to perform uh, PET imaging. If there is no secretion and if there is no uh, PPGL on morphological imaging, I think that PET imaging is not clearly mandatory. Uh, if it's difficult, I think uh, it is not mandatory. But in a patient with SDH mutation and at least one PPGL, or a secretion, I would suggest to perform a PET imaging. And I would start with a somatostatin receptor PET imaging in patients with SDH mutation. Okay. And to be clear, if, if the patient does not have a known mutation, you would start with CT and MRI and... Uh, ah, so if the patient, yeah, if the patient has no mutation, and if there is, for example, a pheochromocytoma, and it is clearly um, a sporadic case. I think PET imaging is not mandatory, but it depends on the size of the tumor. If it is a large uh, PPGL, I would suggest, for example, more than in, in the setting of sporadic case, more than six centimeter, I would suggest to perform PET imaging because in large PPGL, it can be associated with metastasis and PET imaging is the best uh, imaging uh, procedure to detect uh, distance metastasis. So it depends on the size. For example, in a patient with a four centimeter uh, pheochromocytoma with a negative genetic screening, I think it is not mandatory to perform PET imaging before surgery. Okay, great. Um, and another question, uh, at what age would you recommend beginning to scan children with um, SDHD? Um, also, it, as a follow-up then, at the other SDH mutations, um, but beginning with SDHD, and what scans would you order and how often? So what, what yeah. age, what scans, how often? Uh, I think it, it is, it, 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 if it's possible for D, I think that 16 could be great. For me, 16 is a great age for D. Uh, I would suggest to start by MRI because uh, they will have no exposure to any ionizing radiation. So I will clearly start with MRI. 
For SDHB, I think that we have to start earlier. I, I think that it is, it, it could be great to start around 10 to 12 year old uh, in patient with SDHB because we have many uh, pediatric cases with SDHB. And I will also start by always by secretion, but also by MRI. I will not perform a PET imaging for children, uh, except if they have at least one PPGL. Okay. And for um, SDHA and C, would your recommends be, recommendations be similar to D or? No, I, I, I think for C, it could, be, it could be 16 or 18. There is no problem because the disease is clearly limited to the head and neck and thoracic uh, area. There are quasi no malignancy in the setting of SDHC. So I think we can, we can start with, always with secretion, but for, uh, from an imaging standpoint, I think we can start by, uh, at... 18 I, at 16 or 18, it's okay for SDHC. For SDHA, we have no, <laughs> we have, there is not a lot of published cases, yeah. but I think I, I, I would perform the same that for B. I think mm -hmm. A and B are closed. I think the malignancy risk associated with SDHE A is, uh, is higher than for D. So I think I will I will start at the same age than B uh, because it could be it could be malignant. Okay, and what about VHL patients? Just because I know there are a lot of uh... yeah yeah it depends of the mutation because we have to, you have to know and you know that uh, there is in VHL uh, a very good relationship between the genetic mutation and the phenotype. There is some VHL without fluchromocytoma, and there are VHL disease with fluchromocytoma. It could be fluchromocytoma alone, and it could be fluchromocytoma associated, for example, with uh, cerebellar or medullar uh, hemangioblastoma and renal cell carcinoma. So first, we have to check the mutation to know if there is, for example, a risk for pheochromocytoma because, because it is not always the case. And I think that 18, 16 or 18 is a good age for pheochromocytoma. Uh, but you know that there are some additional tumors that has to be depicted by imaging uh, in the setting of virtual disease. And uh, um, for a patient with virtual disease that predispose to cerebellar hemangioblastoma or pancreatic net or also renal carcinoma, the imaging studies should be earlier. And I think that uh, the physicians are much more concerned by uh, um, um, central nervous system hemangioblastoma or retinal hemangioblastoma or renal cell carcinoma than for chromocytoma because it is relatively easy to detect uh, fibromocytoma because they are almost always secreting. They secrete nor, nor, noradrenaline and they are restricted to the abdomen, adrenal medulla or extra adrenal uh, paraganglioma. And there are quasi no, the risk of malignancy is probably below 5%. It is between two to 5% in the setting of VHL disease. So I think I was first, I, first I will check the mutation uh, type to know if there is a risk for a uh, chromocytoma. And if there is a risk, it depends if it is isolated or associated with other tumor uh, that may occur in the setting of VHL disease. Okay, great. Thanks for that comprehensive answer. Um, I have a follow-up, I think, to our uh, earlier discussion about the SDH mutations. I have a patient asking, how often do you see metastatic disease with the SDHA mutation? Um, I think with, uh, with morphological imaging, I think it has to be between what, I think we can start, for example, with six months. And if it's stable, uh, it could be 
a new six months, and if it's stable, it could be yearly. Um, the use of PET uh, imaging in the follow-up of SDH patient, even metastatic patient with SDH mutation, should be discussed on an individual basis. Uh, it is not mandatory to perform regular PET CT in the follow-up of patient, but it may help in some uh, specific and individual situation. So it has to be, I think it is important to have a baseline, a baseline PET CT, but after I think it is not mandatory to perform regular PET CT or at least maybe every three years, but it could be, it has to be discussed in the setting of um, a, a multidisciplinary uh, staff um, a board meeting to discuss in a given situation if it is useful. But morphological imaging, I think, is much more useful in the follow-up of patients with metastatic disease than PET imaging. Okay. And do you see many patients with that mutation who have metastatic disease? Like, are there a, a large number of them? Is it relatively small? Do we know yet with that mutation? Like the numbers Which mutation? of people? SDHA. Which no, it's very rare. I think we have, in our center, I think we have two cases. Okay. Uh, the, the larger cohort come from the NIH. I think they are at least, I think they have 10 patients and they have published uh, their case. Uh, we do not clearly know the risk of malignancy, but I think it could be close to SDHB, but okay. this is not sure because there is only a few number of published cases. Great. Well, that's a, a good information and uh, important to know. I think that will actually be our last question and I will do some uh, follow-up then here. Dr. Taib, first I wanna thank you sincerely for your time and your considerable expertise. We value your uh, time here today. The presentation was amazing. You gave us some really good answers. And of course, we're grateful that you're on our board of directors and uh, we enjoy working with you. So thank you so much for coming today. Um, I do also need to let everyone know that Progenix is uh, someone else we need to thank and our other sponsors, Advanced Accelerator Applications, for making this conference possible. This and all sessions will be available for viewing on the platform. Um, they've been recorded today. They should be available tomorrow. So there'll be a day's lag between the session airing and when it's available to watch as a recording. Um, we'd like to invite you to tune in to the rest of our conference sessions in the coming days. We have some fun things and some interesting topics um, later today and throughout the week. And also encourage you to tune in to our special Awareness Week events. Um, the AAES is holding a discussion panel this evening. We have two events tomorrow and then another on Thursday. You can find all of this information on social media or at www.theopara.org. We also encourage you to participate in Awareness Week. If you go to our website, you can download your utility belt, AKA our toolkit, where you can find some fun statistics for social, to share on social media. Um, we have a create your own avatar, uh, not really a contest going, but definitely a challenge. The um, challenge to change the world packet is there and live, and we invite you to share updated information contained in that packet with your local healthcare providers and help spread current information and awareness about FIO and PARA. And finally, we wanna thank everyone who attended today and wish you all a FIO PARA fearless day. Thank you, Dr. Taib. Thank you.